Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Alberta Health Minister Jason Copping explains how the province is enhancing lab services in many communities, including here in Lethbridge. A criminal defence lawyer speaks out against the Trudeau Liberals' new handgun legislation. And a BC man has become one of the first in Canada to receive compensation after being injured following a COVID-19 vaccine shot. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The federal government has tabled legislation to limit handguns and has pledged to buy back assault-style weapons. The new bill includes a national freeze on buying, selling and importing handguns. To discuss this in more detail is criminal defence lawyer Ari Goldkind who joins us now from Toronto. Ari, some say Bill C-21 just targets law-abiding gun owners and does nothing to address the gun violence here in Canada. How do you see it? I think this is so stupid and so pedantic, so facile, so childish that the government of Canada, particularly our public safety minister, let alone prime minister speaking moistly, is pulling a con job on the Canadian public. That's what this is. As a criminal defense lawyer, I can tell you a number of things. One, this will make no difference to gun crime. Two, this will make no difference to the people who commit gun crime. Three, it will make no difference to their ability to obtain the firearms they use in the commission of their violent gun crime. Four, full disclosure for your viewers, I detest guns. I think we should have a gun-free society. I am not a pro-gun person, and I still think this is stupid. The only people that I think should have guns are people that live in rural areas, where if you call 911, the cops don't get there at the speed they get there in Toronto, Vancouver, or Montreal. But don't let anybody misread my idea that this is so colossally stupid and a con job as me being somebody who does anything other than hate the NRA and is not a fan of guns. But this is really stupid. Thank you so much, Ari. That was criminal defense lawyer Ari Goldkind joining us from Toronto. Alan Friesen is a firearms instructor and the past president of the Lethbridge Fish and Game Association. He says the new Bill C-21 will have a huge impact on gun owners. He explains how. It kind of reveals as we go with the changes. As an example, there's not supposed to be a registry, but there is a registry now, right? So there was a registry was was put in place, then discontinued a number of years ago. Now on an unofficial basis, they've introduced a registry. So people like Marksman Guns and Sports, where they have a store as of like a week ago, now they have to record every transaction, the owner, and they have to maintain these records for 20 years. Two is is that these firearms that now have been said, oh, these are too scary, Canadians can't own them, those ones that are going to be prohibited, well, those, that equipment then will be apparently bought back. The owner of a gun shop in the lower mainland of British Columbia says people have been flocking to buy handguns after the Liberal government announced it was tabling legislation that seeks to freeze handgun sales across the country. Scott Carpenter, the owner of International Shooting Supplies in Surrey, says he sold a month's worth of handguns in just a single day. He said some of his competitors had to close their doors in order to replenish their stock. The Liberals' proposed legislation would not ban handguns outright, allowing existing owners to keep and continue to use them. Federal stats show the number of registered handguns in Canada increased by just over 70% between 2010 and 2020, reaching 1.1 million. The deadline arrived this week for Calgary police officers to remove a symbolic patch from their uniforms. For decades, the thin blue line has been a symbol of law and order and to commemorate support for fallen soldiers and officers. But the Calgary Police Commission issued a directive banning the patch, saying that the symbol carries a negative connotation associated with racism stemming from the, its involvement in Black Lives Matter counter-protests. So is a ban like this something that could happen here in Lethbridge? Well, we reached out to the Lethbridge Police Commission to find out. But to our knowledge, there are no officers who are wearing the patch um, and they've never had a request to change that policy. So it really hasn't been an issue in the, with the Lethbridge Police Service. I understand the officer's desire to honour their traditions. I, I get the officer's desire to honour the, their fallen comrades, and that's extremely important to them. And that's sort of that, that, I mean, every day our officers go off in the front lines and they put their lives on the line. And I think that's something that we don't always quite understand the depth of what that means to them as officers. So I think any way that they can 
sort of celebrate that and honor that I think is is important. Whether whether the thin blue line is the way to do it, I don't know. I don't have an opinion on that, but I do believe it's important for us to support our officers in the fact that they 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 put their lives on the line each and every day for our safety. Vance Bronson added that the relationship between Lethbridge's Police Commission, Police Association, and the Police Service is at an all-time high, and it would be counterproductive to create division. Lethbridge police were called out to a high-risk incident on the city's west side. LPS say a male has barricaded himself in an apartment building along the 2500 block of Walsh Drive. Police have asked members of the public to avoid the area. We'll have more information for you as it becomes available. RCMP and Cardston are investigating an attempted abduction of a female, which occurred on May the 17th. Police say the victim was approached by a man in front of the Cardston Hospital. She was told to get into his vehicle. Now, she declined and left, but was followed by the man to Moses Lake. Once in Moses Lake, the suspect then jumped out of his vehicle and allegedly tried to force her into his vehicle. She was able to flee, and the suspect left the area. Now, the suspect is being described as a light-skinned male, around 6 foot 3 inches tall, 40 years of age, bald with no teeth and tattoos covering both arms. He may have been driving a red Chevy Impala. If you have information that can help police with their investigation, call Crime Stoppers right away at 1-800-222-8477. RCMP in Strathmore responded to an abduction of a female youth on Monday. The victim was walking home from her school bus stop when she was approached by two men in a white pickup truck. She was then allegedly forced into the vehicle and taken to a residence. The victim was able to get away and run to safety. Police say they're looking for one male suspect who is described as having light-colored skin, clean-shaven with long black hair and blue eyes. The second is also clean-shaven with light-colored skin, wearing a white shirt and gray sweatpants. The suspect vehicle is a white four-door truck with a gray interior. Now, if you have any information, you're asked to contact the Strathmore RCMP at 403-934-3968. Well, we enjoyed another beautiful day here in the city of Lethbridge. Lots of sunshine and warm temperatures, and not a bad weekend is shaping up. Jeanette Roche is in now with an early peek at the forecast. Jeanette, the warm temperatures could be with us for the next couple of days. Hal, we're looking at highs of 23 over the next couple days. Lots of sunshine on Friday as well with increasing clouds later on in the day and a UV index of 8 or very high. So that means we could need to break out the sunscreen if you're prone to sunburn and planning on spending a lot of time outdoors tomorrow. A totally different story, though, coming up later on in the weekend when it's going to cool down quite a bit and more moisture on the way. I'll get to all those details coming up later on in the newscast. Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. A BC man has become one of the first in Canada to be approved for compensation through the Federal Vaccine Injury Support Program. 40-year-old Lake Country Realtor Ross Whiteman says he suffered nerve damage and became partially paralyzed a year ago after taking the COVID-19 vaccine. He says he developed a rare neurological disorder after receiving the AstraZeneca vaccine in April of 2021. Whiteman says he had no leg function and spent 67 days in hospital. Fortunately, he is now back on his feet again. Uh, I'm walking around on my own, uh, unassisted. Uh, I have to wear special orthotics for my for my feet, and uh, my hands are still hands and wrists are still slowly coming along. But um, definitely, definitely a vast, drastic improvement from a year ago. That's for sure. So, uh, trying to keep the head high, and 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 you know. Up we go. No looking back. Whiteman didn't say how much money he received, but has said it wasn't the maximum, which is set at $248,000. So far, 400 people have put in vaccine injury claims here in Canada. The Alberta government announced that beginning December 5th, Dynalife Medical Labs will be providing community and non-urgent hospital lab services in communities across the province. The company has already provided lab services for more than 25 years across much of central and northern Alberta. Around 65% of provincial lab work, around 50 million tests per year, is generated within the community. Officials say Dynalife Medical Labs will help meet that need in many regions, including here in Lethbridge and in Medicine Hat. First and foremost, it will give Albertans more and better services. Dynalife's expertise will improve quality and consistency for patients at the point of care, and they'll upgrade and expand service centres in Calgary, Edmonton, Red Deer, Lethbridge, Fort McMurray, Leduc, Okotoks, Strathmore, and Cochrane. Plus, they'll be making improvements at the centralized hub labs in Edmonton and right here at this location in Calgary. And second, this contract will create efficiencies and cost savings 
of between 18 to $36 million a year. Copping says each dollar that is saved will stay within the healthcare system to offer more services for Albertans. The fallout from the Jason Kenney leadership review and subsequent Kenney resignation has been felt in a number of ways. Now that's according to political science professor Dr. Dwayne Bratt, who teaches at Mount Royal University. Bratt presented at SACPA on Thursday and said Premier Kenney dug his own grave during the pandemic, which led to a lot of supporters losing trust in him as leader and the issues with Aloha Gate after ministers within the Kenney caucus took trips abroad while Albertans stayed home during the lockdowns. First, he was defiant, saying... You know, I take responsibility, but we did nothing wrong. The rules were confusing. Then there was such a public backlash that the government had to apologize. But he didn't apologize. He sent Rick McIver and Tyler Shandro out to apologize. The lack of empathy during COVID, the lack of acknowledgement that 4,300 Albertans are dead, um, and, and his failure to ever admit error or apologize, I think that is part of the leadership issue that people had with, with Kenny. Elections Alberta says Brian Jean, Daniel Smith, Todd Lowen and Travis Taves have filed the official paperwork to run for the leadership of the UCP. The UCP announced that Jason Nixon is the new Minister of Finance, taking over from Travis Taves, who stepped down to seek the party's leadership. This weekend, the Kidney Foundation is hosting their annual Kidney Walk, an event to help raise awareness and support people fighting this deadly disease. This is the 10th year the event has been taking place, and it'll be held virtually, however, with walkers in both Medicine Hat and Lethbridge hitting the streets. An official with the Kidney Foundation says the walk is also an opportunity to raise funds and provide programs for those who may be suffering. Kidney Walk is... Um, one of the major events that supports the Kinney Foundation and in that we, it's an opportunity for the Kinney Foundation to support patients and their families with programs and services. Um, it supports organ donation initiatives and various education programs as well. So that is huge for um, the Kinney Foundation. We've developed quite the kid great Kinney Walk community in Southern Alberta. When we come together, we're stronger than kidney disease. And no matter what format it takes, our community steps up and there's really no limits um, to supporting our kidney and transplant community when they need it the most. According to the Kidney Foundation, kidney disease can affect anyone at any age, and about 46% of new patients recently diagnosed are under the age of 65. St. Patrick's Fine Arts Elementary School held a teepee celebration for the students to learn all about Indigenous culture and reflect on their families and values. The students were tasked with creating their own teepees with a story drawn upon it. Now, official with the Catholic School Division says he's happy to be able to share Blackfoot culture with the students. I'm just happy to have shared that energy that was brought forth by it and uh, you know I, I love sharing our, our culture as well and definitely uh, here in Lethbridge in, the, in regards to the current uh, relationship building that has gone forward and I greatly appreciate the city of Lethbridge for pushing forward in that manner. Meanwhile a grade two student says she made her teepee especially for her grandmother. I have uh, the sunset because um, my grandma really liked watching the sunset and she died. I have spring because when I draw this we were in spring um, and spring is one of my favorite seasons. I learned that there's a lot of different ways to say different words in Blackfoot and Indigenous people. Oh, she is so adorable. This was the first event back since the start of the pandemic. A Southern Alberta man has a special exhibition on display in Pincher Creek. The Grassland series showcases the unique animals that are native to our beautiful province. Video journalist Micah Quinn has the details on why the artist chose to document these interesting creatures. The Grassland series is an ongoing body of artwork that showcases the beauty that we have here on the Canadian grasslands with an emphasis on that that exists here in southern Alberta. Colin Starkovich has been working on the Grassland series since 2009 when he was just 19 years old. The exhibition features 30 plein air paintings, erratic drawings, and fine art realism paintings. At that time is when I kind of realized inside of myself that's where I wanted to focus my artistic practice and spend the better part of my life doing my very best as an artist to portray this region and share it with the world as I feel the grasslands are 
uh, region that's quite overlooked, and it's actually one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. One of Starkovich's favorite creations of art is a piece he completed in 2012 at the University of Lethbridge. It has been one of my most successful paintings to date, and looking back on it now, I still can't believe that a 22-year-old kid at the time painted something like this in a university dorm room. And I'm hoping my artwork can help and act as that inspiration for a lot of viewers. Starkovich says he wanted to portray species at risk within the grassland series, like the burrowing owl, but also animals like the coyote. A portion of sales from the grassland series will also be donated to the Alberta Conservation Association, as well as the LaBelle Mansion Gallery. Which will in turn help support future artists like myself to show their talents with the world and share their vision with the world. The grassland series exhibition will be on display until June 24th at the LaBelle Mansion in Pincher Creek. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Now here's a follow-up to a story we first brought you earlier in the month. A beautiful bronze statue has now made its way to the Lethbridge Military Museum. The bust depicts the first World War contributions of the artillery and horses in southern Alberta. Staff from the museum say the bronze statue will now be forever immortalized in their building. Four days of celebrations honoring Queen Elizabeth II's 70 years on the throne are well underway. The Jubilee Party will include thousands of street parties, garden lunches and park picnics in the United Kingdom. Britain is in the mood for a bash, not only to honour the Queen's record-breaking reign, but also as a release following three pandemic lockdowns and around 180,000 COVID-19-related deaths. The Queen's reign has seen a lot of change over the years. Her first public addresses were on radio, and now her remarks are posted on Instagram and Twitter. So great to see. Also wonderful to see all of the vitamin D we had today, lots of sunshine and warm temperatures, and that will continue for the short term. But what will happen after that? Will we get some more rain? Full weather details are coming up. Lots of sunshine and warm temperatures again for our region. Jeanette Rocher is in now with a complete look at the weather picture. Jeanette, as we plan ahead, it should be a nice weekend for camping. Yeah, the temperature is certainly expected to rise over the next couple of days. How we are looking at highs of 23 degrees for both Friday and Saturday. Friday, especially uh, starting out very sunny, looking at a UV index of eight, increasing clouds later on the day. We're going to be seeing a wind from the southeast as well at 20K and then gusting up to 40. Saturday, mainly cloudy skies, though, 23. Sunday, that's when the rain starts, going to last all the way through till Tuesday. High of 12 on Sunday, 17 on Monday, high of 18 degrees Tuesday and then back up to 22 with sunshine on a Wednesday. So we are going to get that little cooling down period, particularly on Sunday when we're going to fall back down to only 12 degrees. But average high for this time of year, 21, average low 7. 32 was our high temperature on this day back in 1970. And in 1984, we had our chilliest, which was zero. Uh, five at 28 is when the sun rose this morning and our sun set this evening, 931, giving us uh, 16 hours and about three minutes of daylight. Two minutes minutes longer than yesterday. Okay, periods of drizzle tomorrow on the west coast of Victoria, high 13 degrees. Vancouver looking at heavy rains, 20 to 30 millimeters, 15 degrees the high, 23 the high at Edmonton should be a lovely day with sunshine. 21 in Calgary with a mix of sun and cloud looking at winds of 20 to 40 K there as well. Over on the prairies, beautiful sunshine, 22 degrees in Saskatoon, 21 the high in Regina tomorrow and a high of 19 degrees in Winnipeg tomorrow under sunny skies and all three of those cities expecting winds gusting around 20 kilometers per hour. So not too bad there at all in the central part of the country. We're looking at Toronto starting off sunny, but then uh, increasing clouds and then expecting some showers later on in the day, 23 the high. Ottawa looking at a high of 24, rain showers, risk of a thunderstorm. Montreal's high 21 degrees, looking for some showers there. Also could be expecting some thunderstorms there as well. 19 the high in Fredericton with showers, sunny skies in Halifax, high 21. 14 degrees the high in Charlottetown and 8 degrees the high in St. John's, Newfoundland. Looking at some showers there and a bit of wind as well. So there you have it, that is your forecast. The Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada says it may need to double its key interest rate from the current 1.5% to put a lid on inflation. Paul Beaudry says the central bank may have to push its policy rate up to 2 or even 3%. The groundwork for more oversized hikes comes the day after the central bank raised its benchmark rate by half a percentage point to 1.5%. 
Beaudry says higher interest rates will bring demand and supply into balance to help ease inflationary pressures. OPEC and other oil producing nations, including Russia, says it will raise oil production by 648,000 barrels a day in July and August. A move analysts say should offer some modest relief from soaring energy prices. The group had already been adding 432,000 barrels per day each month to restore production cuts from 2020. The move to increase production faster comes as rising crude prices have pushed gas and inflation to record highs in both Canada and the United States. Automotive sales across Canada were down 8.5% last month from a year earlier to around 140,725 vehicles. That's according to automotive consultant Rosier. It says supply challenges linked in part to semiconductor chip shortages continue to hamper sales in May, which traditionally is the top sales month. Officials say the trend is concerning since sales continue to fall each month throughout the year. They say the market supply situation appears to be getting worse. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 318 points on the day to finish at 21,031. The Dow was up 435 points to 33,248. The S&P 500 was up 75 points to 4176. And the Nasdaq was up 322 on the day to 12,316. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up $1.61 to 116.87 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 21 cents to 849 US. Gold was up six cents to 1868.64 US an ounce. And silver was up a cent to 22.32 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $16.05 per bushel, barley's at $10.23, canola's at $26.01, and corn is at $12.06 per bushel. Live cattle were up $0.83 cents to $133.63, feeder cattle August contract was up $3.23 to $172.95, and lean hogs were up $0.25 cents to $110.05. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to $79.52 US. Recapping one of our top stories, the province announced that beginning December 5th, Dynalive Medical Labs will be providing community and non-urgent hospital lab services in communities across the province. The company has already provided lab services for more than 25 years across much of central and northern Alberta. Around 65% of provincial lab work, or around 50 million tests per year, is generated within the community. The new labs will include locations in Lethbridge and Medicine Hat. A documentary is being produced on the Freedom Convoy, which took place last February in Ottawa. Coming up, we shall chat with the producers of that project, who say it was important to show viewers what exactly transpired during that trucker protest. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. Come out and support a worthy cause. The Kidney Foundation of Canada is holding a virtual kidney walk on Sunday, June 5th. Walk in your neighborhood and join online for a celebration across Western Canada. While walking different paths, this virtual fundraiser unites all who take part in support of finding a cure for kidney disease. To register and for more information, visit kidneywalk.ca. Lethbridge Sport Council's Indoor Roving Gyms program is taking place Tuesdays at Emmanuel Lutheran Church from 6 to 7 p.m. and Thursdays at the Service Sports Centre from 10 to 11 a.m. This program is for kids ages 5 and under and their caregivers. Come and enjoy an hour of fun and get active. Pre-registration is required and space is limited. For details and to register, visit lethbridgesportcouncil.ca. And that's your Bridge City News Community Calendar. It's been three months since the Freedom Convoy and Rally in our nation's capital, and there are two Calgarians who spent their time in Ottawa digitally documenting the events during that time. It's been made into a documentary, and the creators of that film, Jeremy Rigotto and Andrew Peloso, join me from Calgary to talk about their experiences in Ottawa and what people can expect from the film. Jeremy and Andrew, thanks so much for joining me today. Pleased to meet you. It's pleased to meet you too. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you. So thinking back to your February 2022 Freedom Rally experience, was it your intent to document the whole convoy and rally? So yeah, originally it was our intent to, to document the, the rally, but it was a, 
we definitely got more than what we were expecting. Um, Andrew called me pretty much the night before the, the convoy was going to start. And he said, hey, I, I got word of this group of trucks that's going to be driving across the country. Uh, do you want to maybe film it? It could be pretty cinematic. I said, sure, like, I guess I'm pretty busy, but OK, let's let's go ahead and, and film this thing. And uh, and it exploded. It, it became way bigger than than either of us could have ever imagined. And uh, and it wasn't just us that filmed it. We ended up putting up a, a we transfer link and, and all of Canada was sending us their footage uh, from from this event happening right across the country, right across the world, actually. It was happening all over the world. Uh, so it was always our intent, but we definitely we definitely got a whole lot more than we were asking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was definitely big news all over the world. Andrew, uh, Jeremy mentioned that you reached out to him. Now, are you guys documentarians by trade or what was the, the motive for, for doing this and for going there? Yeah, we're both in the media and marketing industry. Um, prior to this, I'd been working on a documentary on cancel culture for about three years and it's set to release this fall. Um, however, I was taking a break. Um, I was on vacation. It was my father who sent me this link about this bear hug, this uh, convoy across Canada. And I just thought the prospect of that amount of vehicles on the road converging in on a city was probably a sight to behold, but I had no idea what we were uh, planned for. Um, Jeremy, we're, we're business partners, and I called him really late at night and said, man, I think we need to go do this thing. What do you say? And um, he was gracious enough to uproot his entire schedule. And uh, we drove in this SUV together and we just started documenting. The first day we were coding a website in the car to show that we're gonna make this film. And uh, by the time we had launched it, we were getting 60,000 hits a day across Canada with people uploading cell footage from different overpasses all over. So there was a real sense of camaraderie and uh, of Canadian spirit uh, all the way through the, the trail. Yeah, it was pretty spectacular to watch. Now, did you actually drive to Ottawa with the convoy? Yeah, that's correct. We, we did drive with the, the convoy all the way to Ottawa. Uh, we were following some of the organizers of the uh, the convoy, uh, we were in and out of their vehicles, we were in and out of truckers' vehicles, doing interviews as we were driving across the country, trying to get ahead of the convoy, putting up drones, trying to capture that. It's uh, it, was, it was days full. It was 23-hour days for a week straight as we drove across the country in, in pretty, pretty remarkable winter Canadian road conditions. So it was, it was an adventure to say the least. Unbelievable. That sounds like a lot of hard work. So what was your initial reaction when you first arrived in Ottawa? Well, first initial reaction was we didn't know the evening prior to the beginning of the demonstration if we were even going to get into the city. There was so much, um, um, I guess, misinformation. Uh, it felt like um, people as well were a little paranoid because no one's getting sleep on the road. Um, we thought potentially the military could be blockading Ottawa and we wouldn't be able to get in, but we were able to get in. Um, my impression would be that, you know, there's going to be a bunch of trucks down near Wellington Street, right by the Parliament. Um, but I didn't realize the amount of foot traffic and amount of people that came into Ottawa for that first um, for that first weekend. It, it felt I don't have a, a final number, but it really felt like the population of Ottawa had doubled. Um, and it was really beautiful because the heart of this movement, capturing it during the early days before we saw any uh, government action, um, it was really just based around um, freedom and, 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 you know, everyone's personal choice to make decisions for themselves and their family um, that they believe are decisions of conscience. And um, that was quite beautiful to see. It, it certainly gave me hope. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned, of course, you're talking about the, the beauty of people coming together. But, of course, there were a lot of points of contention uh, with this convoy as well. And I, I guess the the impact of the con that the convoy maybe had on the citizens of Ottawa. So what were your recollections of the interactions with locals while you were there? Honestly, the truth is that... We tried to find people that were upset about the Freedom Convoy being there. Uh, and there were a lot of people that were coming down to 
the uh, like Wellington Street just to see what was going on because they were hearing about things on the news and and uh, and in general, I would say the majority of people came down expecting to be upset. Uh, of Ottawa citizens came down to expecting to be upset, um, and then realized what was actually going on. That the streets were clean, that there were bouncy castles, that it was like a parade. It was a celebration uh, for Canada. It was like Canada Day on steroids. Uh, and then they were coming down every single opportunity they had. After work, they'd come down. Uh, they'd give out food. They'd give out cash. They'd um, try to their best to encourage. Uh, we tried to get as many people on camera as possible talking about their experiences, uh, as many Ottawa citizens as possible talking about their experiences. We did get a few, but for the most part, people were afraid to, to talk on camera, uh, not because they were afraid to share their feelings, but because they were afraid of who might see it, whether their employer might see it or uh, their family members might see it or... Like people are genuinely afraid of what's going on right now and afraid for their own security, afraid for their own uh, employment. Um, and that's honestly one of the reasons why we are doing what we're doing is because we have to, we have to normalize uh, and, and, and chase away this fear of, of a difference of opinion uh, and freedom of thought and speech. Um, so that's that's the honest truth is we were looking very hard for people that were upset. Um, there were a few people that we talked to that said like it was pretty noisy the first couple of days, but then the, the truck stopped honking and we didn't really even notice. Um, we asked people if they were having difficulty getting around downtown. And sure, there were a couple streets that were uh, had a lot of vehicles on them, but not one street was completely blocked off. There was always a lane open for emergency vehicles or for travel. We drove in and out of downtown uh, quite a bit. Uh, and we had no issues. Google was really accurate. There was no extension in, in time getting around. Um, so that's, that's the honest truth is there was nobody that we encountered that was over the top upset. There were a couple anti-protesters that we saw with, with signs and stuff like that. We tried to get interviews. Those people wouldn't talk on camera, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, but but we're, we did get a little bit, so we're we're excited to we're excited to get into those chapters later on in the series uh, mm -hmm. and, and and share their stories also. Okay, so so that part of it is included in your documentary as well. Yeah, we're focused focus on a story of Canada um, that's unbiased and for everyone. We are not trying to make media that encourage um, viewers to think any which way. We're just trying to say that this happened. Uh, we were able to document um, so much of the movement, and we feel all Canadians, regardless of their view, need to know what happened in Ottawa for those 33 days. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what you're trying to accomplish with this documentary. You bet. Okay. What's what's the name of the film? So it's a docu-series. We decided to put it out as a docu-series because of the release schedule time. We didn't want to stay in editorial for a year and release it towards 2023. Um, so it's a six-part mini-series called Trucking for Freedom. And the website is truckingforfreedom.com. That's free to view for anyone. It's free to download for everyone. And uh, you can post it anywhere. So we really received our mandate from the Canadian people and we had people purchasing film credits where th that's funding this this production. And so as a result, we're able to, to give that and distribute it for free. Okay. Um, what are you hoping that viewers will take away from watching it? Honestly, we're, we're hoping that we can somewhat neutralize the extremes that we're experiencing in our society right now. Um, you're either really right or you're really left or you're, you're one extreme or you're another extreme. And we feel like the society has done a, a half decent job at polarizing us uh, and putting us at, at, at ends. Um, our call to the people watching this film is that we can come back to a middle ground where, where people can feel unified as citizens of Canada, as people of the world, uh, and, and have hope that we can live in a society 
where we are free to disagree and still love each other. That's that's our hope for uh, for people that are watching this film. Wow. And did you mention that chapter one, you've already got that completed? Yeah, we, we released chapter one this uh, Sunday. Um, since releasing, it's been only a couple days and we're getting close to over 3 million minutes streamed on our website just organically. We haven't advertised this at all. Um, so it's very evident that uh, Canada, you can just see the map lighting up with different people and IP addresses watching this film. Um, so we released Saturday the first chapter, which is how we got here, which served as a bit of a chronology of the last two years of policy um, and social implications and impacts of lockdowns that served as the fuel that caused this freedom convoy and respective movement to develop. So, so far, what have been the reactions from people who have seen in chapter one? Oh, we've had nothing but positive feedback, honestly. Uh, we've been crawling social media. We've been, uh, you should see our inbox. Our inbox is completely lit up. Um, I haven't seen, personally, I haven't seen one negative response to, uh, to what we put out there. Um, and people are sharing it like wildfire. There's, there's yes, absolutely that 3 million minutes that are viewed on our website, but the way that we posted this with that download feature, we were having different groups, having uh, live watch parties um, and streaming the, the show, and they have been for the past three days. Um, so so the, the amount of people that must have seen this already is, is, is huge, staggering numbers, more than we ever imagined when we first left Calgary uh, and joined this convoy. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Wow. That's, that's actually really impressive. Now, I'm just curious, how involved was the rest of your family during the making of this film or during the time that you were gone? Did you have their support or were they against it? Yeah, it's, uh, I guess I can answer first, but Jer has to answer that too. My, my family has been supportive. They, um, um, believe that, you know, our, all Canadians should be able to, freely travel and socialize and assemble regardless of, of medical status or, or, or what our federal government thinks. And um, so they're very quite supportive of, of this project. Um, a family as well um, and friends that are supportive of this regardless of their, their medical status, right? Because I think it gets something way deeper than um, what some of the legacy media would like us all to believe. This is not a this is not a conversation about um, uh, medicine. This is more of a conversation about freedom. And I think um, the majority of Canadians can all get behind uh, wanting a free society. But Jeremy, over to you, man. Yeah, my family's been incredibly supportive the whole time. Uh, all the way from the very first week when we uprooted our lives, uh, they were taking on responsibilities that I had at home. Um, and... And they they aided with uh, financially right off the bat uh, with keeping this team on the road. Um, they're they're they've always been supportive with anything that I've tried to do. But uh, but this especially they feel like it's so 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 incredibly important. Um, and I have full full support from my immediate family, uh, extended family. There's some extended family that I I I would say I would go as far. As, some people even being disappointed with what we're doing, uh, but that that again is why is why we have to do this um, is to to bring people back to a center ground where we can be a unified Canada again. Mm, interesting, fantastic. It looks like we are out of time, but we could go on talking about this all day because it's such an interesting topic. But Jeremy and Andrew, thanks so much for joining me today. Really appreciate having you on. Well, thank you so much, Jeanette. Thank you. That was Jeremy Rigotto and Andrew Pelozzo, the creators of the Trucking for Freedom documentary. They are joining me from Calgary. Well, the Christian church has been around a long time, but how church services are held and how the church functions have certainly changed. So what should it look like in modern times? Well, joining me to discuss this is Kelly Stickle, who is the lead pastor at Parallel Church in Lethbridge. Pastor Kelly, so great to have you on again. Thanks for joining us. 
Thanks so much, Jeanette. It's great to be with you again. Awesome. Okay, so first of all, many viewers know your church by its former name, right, which was My Victory Church. So why the change and what's the significance of your new name? Yeah, well, that's a, a loaded question, but the big driving force behind that this last two years, as you know, and everyone of uh, your viewers is well aware of, was very disruptive in, in multiple ways, not just with COVID, but with also a lot of the political disruption, a lot of race issues, especially south of the border, um, and a lot of, I, I think, a lot more uh, divisiveness uh, in culture as a whole. And uh, I think for us, we wanted to stand out and say, as a church, Jesus called us to unity. As a church, he called us to, to separate ourselves from, from society in, in many ways. And so we decided in the midst of all the divisiveness, we wanted to come alongside. And so we chose the name Parallel uh, to say we want to walk with people. We want to come alongside with people and, and be a voice that is opposite of, of what is becoming the norm in society today and, and divides and, and divisiveness. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. That was a loaded question with a loaded answer. Thank you for that. So Kelly, your church slogan is for love and impact. So I think for years, many churches were known for what they stood against, right? But it's also important to let people know what the church is for. So it sounds like your church wants to be known for love and for having an impact on the community. So maybe you can unpack that a little bit for us. Yeah, well, we, I really, it really stood out to me, John 13, uh, Jesus' conversation with his disciples, it carried on to John 15, of course, where multiple times he said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. And when Jesus gave that command, it wasn't, uh, you know, an additional command to, you know, what we have in the Old Testament. It was, in essence, a replacement command that is the command that we as Christians are supposed to live by. So we're saying, okay, we're going to love, but we're not just going to love. That's a flowery word um, in society and, and misunderstood in many ways. But we're going to love like Jesus loved. And Jesus loved unconditionally. Jesus loved um, the outcast, those that were considered in his time the unlovable. And he just he extended love to, to the point of, of giving himself and his life in love for his friends, like it says. So we're like, we want to love like that. And we want to follow Jesus' command. But we don't want to just, just love like that. We want to have you know, an impact in our community with that kind of love as well. And, you know, Paul said in Galatians 5, 6, that the faith that really matters, the faith that really counts is the one that expresses itself through love. And that kind of became our, our guiding verse saying we're going to impact our community, but we're going to do it um, the Jesus way and, and do it with, with love. And so that, again, we definitely want to be what we're known for, not what we stand against or who we stand against, but we want to be known um, as a church that comes alongside and loves and impacts. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes people who don't regularly attend church might see things through that lens of, you know, us against them or the church versus society. So what does the church need to do to communicate to others that they are welcome to come as they are with all their imperfections without being judged? I mean, people are attending because they want some kind of direction, right? Yeah, and, and I think part of the the big shift for me, I've been pastoring for over 25 years now, and part of the big shift for me is that I've always pastored and led churches with that in with it in mind of I want to get people in the community to come in to to the church. And where I've shifted in in many ways and, and seeing you know what Jesus modeled and how Jesus did his ministry. But then also really studying the early church and the first three centuries in particular and how they modeled what Jesus instructed them to do. And I realized that, it, you know, we can't just wait for the community to come to us when they're ready. We really need to go to them. And I know that sounds, you know, cliche and that sounds easy to do, but going, no, wait a second. We put all of our energies, all of our finances, all of our staffing as a church, all of our monies into into weekend services and hoping that people are going to show up to that. And we're like, no, no, wait a second. Let's reposition how we do church, what we think about church, and let's let's invest more in going to the community throughout the week rather than expecting the community to come to us. So I think the biggest divide has been when we've created these the church as a gathering place 
it, you know, a social club that gathers once a week and say, no, 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 that's not what we're called to be. We're called to not attend church. We're called to be the church. And so let's go to the community and, and reach them rather than waiting for them to come to us. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Now, I, I know on your church website, uh, you actually invite people to these house parties. So what's that all about? Yeah, well, it, it, we... Again, we, we looked at everything, all the language we use, and we realized that a lot of the small groups that we have, and small groups has, is a cliche for a lot of Christians, that people are like, I don't want, really want to be a small group, and they look at it as a, as a Bible study where one person's going to teach them, and they're not sure if they're going to agree, and they'd have to go with people they don't like. We're like, no, like mm -hmm. everywhere Jesus went, he, he threw a party, and it was, it was a lot more about relational connection. Again, studying Jesus' ministry, he was all about, you know, the relational connections and he would, you know, he wanted to go to Zacchaeus's house and have a party and he never taught and it did anything. Just the relational connection led to Zacchaeus's salvation. So we wanted to, to really emphasize the gathering, especially throughout COVID and all the rest of it. We wanted to, you know, really emphasize the relational side of things and said, hey, let's, let's just rephrase that to, to house parties. And in the midst of the relationships, it's amazing. The deeper the relationships, the more spiritual the conversations become and the more, the deeper we can go into scriptures when we have relationship and when we have trust. And so we wanted to start with that on that basis first. And, uh, and then, and then, you know, instead of saying small group, Hey, let's, let's have a house party. Let's gather together, hang out, watch a hockey game. If we need to, whatever, whatever it's going to take um, just to gather. Yeah, you know, and I'm I'm just curious too. With with COVID, I would imagine uh, it was very difficult to do those uh, those small groups, those house parties. Uh, they were non-existent pretty much, and so it's so nice to open up people's homes again and invite others in. But um, have you found that attendance is a little bit different ever since that whole pandemic took place? Uh, it's have people, it's like people were in a momentum, COVID happened, and it's like the world just stopped and so many people's interests have changed. And how have you found that and how have you dealt with it? Yeah, absolutely. We definitely have, have discovered that there's a difference in attendance, but again, um, as as a pastor, I wasn't panicking to the degree of saying, well, people aren't coming back to the church. I was like, when, when I hear that from pastors and from leaders, I begin to question going, well, again, that weekly social gathering that at a building, is that the church or are, are is Christians and how do we reach them? We're reaching them at different levels. So I'm not so worried about, you know, who and you know, is attending or not attending or how often they're attending or ours are our numbers back, you know, pre pandemic. What I really want to focus on is, is are we equipping the church to reach the, and making a difference and an impact in the community? And our tenants did, you know, take big hits like everybody else's and go through that. We're, I mean, happily, we're right back on track and, and going again and excited. But our focus as pastors and as leaders has really shifted and saying, okay, let's not put all of our energy into just getting bums in the seat on a Sunday and think that that's church. Let's, let's equip the, the saints to do the work of the ministry throughout the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Kelly, you believe that a church should choose unity over uniformity, right? So, which means like aligning, even if we don't agree on everything. So that can be a challenge, obviously, when we live in a time like now where there's so much division of you, as you've been talking about. And of course, we're living in this cancel culture now. So what does it take to stay in alignment with one another if we see things differently? Well, I think it's of utmost importance for us as Christ followers to make that a priority because Jesus made it a priority. His his final prayer that we have recorded that he prayed over his disciples. He didn't pray, you know, keep them protected. He didn't pray, keep them theologically correct, you know, keep them baptizing the right way, taking communion the right way. He said, make them one. And he his main prayer was for unity. So I think as the church, we need to make that as, as a priority and model that for the rest of the world. Where it comes to unity, not uniformity, is, is we can value, if we value unity over uniformity, meaning that we don't have to all agree to be in unity. We can, we can be in unity even if we disagree, especially if we disagree. And I think our society as a whole has lost the, 
the the challenge culture, the the willingness to question, the willingness to debate. We we've lost that art in some way, and I think that's very dangerous because we have polarizing sides. Everybody's splitting up and 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 going into their own little camps, and I think that's that's very it's very easy on both sides of the camps to get deceived and to go, you know, to go off the rails too far when we stop, you know, challenging and debating and questioning and, and, and learning how to do that. Uh, I think we need to get back to some of that and saying it's okay to question. It's okay to challenge. It's okay to argue as long as we, you know, we value the relationship and the unity over whether or not we agree. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you go about handling things when, you may have someone who visits your church, but they're opposed to some of the things that you teach and believe in. Do you still welcome them and do you still offer to help them if they need assistance in some area? Yeah, absolutely. Without question, we, we make uh, as much as we possibly can. We, we um, work with those who are willing to work with us regardless of their backgrounds, their beliefs. We have, uh, we have a lot of different backgrounds and different belief systems and and a lot of uh, people that have been raised in church lots that haven't lots that have been raised in way different denominations or belief systems than than what we preach and and so they we have a whole bunch of those that come in there lots from polar opposite sides you know politically uh polar opposite sides religion you know when it comes to religion and belief systems all of that and yet um yet we are able to to work and and do that and, and part of that is just setting a culture to say hey we're going to value unity over uh, agreeing. Yeah, absolutely. It, now, we tend to meet as we normally do in church buildings, and you were kind of alluding to this earlier, and we're in, encouraged to invite people to join us. However, the early church also did a lot of going to taking the church to where people are instead of having them come to a church building, like what you were saying earlier. So what does that look like in today's culture? Well, I think I think the church needs to get uh, take its job back in many ways. Where what I mean by that is the way that the early church got into the community is that, and you see it right in the Book of Acts right away, and then doing historical studies of of some of the practices of the early church, especially in the first three centuries. The early church was known for. Um, Romans would write about the church, and what they were known for is their care of the least of these. It was it was their care for the needy, and and they would you know in Acts chapter two there was no need among them. It's repeated in Acts chapter four, right? They shared with everything. Everyone had everything in common. There's no need among them. They made sure that there was no need in their vicinity, and the church would 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 reach out into the community and and help the widows and the orphans and the poor and feed the hungry. And the church actually grew, uh, historically grew the greatest in the third century. So it entered the year 200 with 200,000 Christians estimated on the planet. And by the year 300 AD, it, there was 6 million Christians on the planet. In the midst of all that, what happened? Well, in 249, there was what's called the Cyprian Plague that lasted 20 years and, and wiped out a fifth of the Roman Empire. What's fascinating is in the midst of that plague, it was Christians that went in. The church went in, ministered to the sick and to, and to the dying. Many of them died themselves, but in that, they offered hope when the rest of society was hopeless. And because of that, the church grew. And I think that's where we got to get our take our job back and get into the community and find needs in our community. And it should be the church that steps up and feeds the hungry, gives water to the thirsty. All the things that Jesus said in Matthew uh, 25 are still great needs today. And I think we need to step up and take that job back. Mm, well said. It uh, looks like we're almost out of time, but Kelly, any final thoughts on where today's church should be heading and what we need to do to be more effective in touching people's lives? I'm more excited than ever with the church, the conversations that I'm, I'm having with pastors, with leaders, with where the church is at. I think, you know, we can look at, you know, COVID as the great disruptor, but I really think we're going to look back in history and saying it was the great revealer where I think a lot of us 
uh, as pastors or leaders are asking the right questions, having the right conversations. And I think the church of the future, I'm more excited about the church of the future than I've ever been. And excited that it's it's gonna step it's stepping up and, and taking its job back and and being more than just a weekly gathering. Thanks so much for being with us today, Pastor Kelly. Really appreciate having you on once again. Yeah, thanks so much, Jeanette. It's great. Absolutely. Kelly Stickle is the pastor at Parallel Church in Lethbridge. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.